Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good evening, and welcome to Cafe Scientific Silicon Valley at SRI. I'm Marty Ritchie from SRI's Corporate and Marketing Communications Group, and I'm here tonight to introduce our speaker, Professor Ed Green, who teaches biomolecular engineering at UC Santa Cruz's Baskin School of Engineering. Dr. Green helped pioneer the use of advanced sequencing technology to study ancient DNA extracted from fossil bones. As a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany, he coordinated the Neanderthal Genome Project, which analyzed four billion base pairs of Neanderthal DNA. That's a lot of Neanderthals. Yeah. A landmark 2010 paper by the Genome Project research team earned them the, the prestigious Newcomb Cleveland Prize for the year's outstanding project or paper published in the Journal of Science. Dr. Green was the lead author on the paper, which posited that Neanderthals and humans interbred shortly after early modern humans migrated out of Africa. In addition to the Neanderthal genome and ancient D DNA work, Dr. Green's research interests also include human evolutionary genetics and regulation of gene expression. So tonight, Dr. Green will discuss how the Neanderthal genome can be contrasted with the human genome to discover what evolutionary changes have happened in our recent past. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ed Green to the stage. Thank you. Um, I think I can still hear. Thank you for the uh, great introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight and talk to you about my work uh, sequencing and analyzing genetic data from our closest extinct relatives, the Neanderthals, and some other extinct relatives that we didn't even know existed uh, that we have also characterized by looking at DNA recovered from very old bones. So um, before I get into it, I just want to uh, show them pictures and names of some people who uh, have helped out on this project along the way, uh, some of the key people here. Uh, the main person really being my former boss, uh, Svante Pabo, who uh, kind of started this field of ancient DNA back in the 80s, imagined that DNA might be intact as a, as a molecule in things that are uh, very, very old, that it can perhaps stick around for a long time, and um, was really the visionary behind the field and uh, uh, the guy who got things going for all of us. Um, so this project, uh, trying to understand humans by uh, looking at things that are very closely related to us, um, this is uh, kind of part of a, a bigger strategy. Um, and we can do this already without Neanderthals by looking at humans and contrasting us against the things that are alive today that are most closely related to us, the great apes. Um, there are a few of these that are uh, around, the chimpanzee and the bonobo and the gorilla and the orangutan. These represent the things that we can go find on the planet today that are our closest relatives. And we know, for example, that the chimpanzee and the bonobo are uh, about six million years ago. We had a common ancestor with them, and the gorilla maybe uh, eight or nine million years ago, and the orangutan even uh, more years ago. We have complete genome sequences from all of these guys, and we can contrast them with us um, to help learn how we are different, how we are unique, which is something that we have always wanted to know. How is it that the human species is different from uh, the other life forms on the planet. And we can look at these guys, look at the chimpanzee, for example, um, and study him very carefully, uh, put him in zoos and look at what he does and measure him physiologically and in other ways, and make um, long lists, uh, a short subset of which is shown here, of things that differ between all humans and all chimpanzees. So these things that are most similar to us that are alive today they still have a lot of interesting differences, and these differences are an answer to this question, what makes humans unique? The things that differ between us and what's most similar to us are what make us unique. And there are some interesting things that uh, uh, we can observe between chimpanzees and humans. And we know that all of these differences are encoded somehow in the genomes of us and them. That the instructions for making bip 
bipedal individuals, uh, an animal that walks on two legs like us. Somewhere in the genome, somewhere in the set of 23 chromosomes that we inherit and start life with, is the instruction for humans for how to walk on two feet. And we know this because it's 100% heritable. Every human who is born will eventually walk on two feet. And every chimpanzee who is born will do this knuckle walking behavior. And we know that we all start life, if you go backwards in time, to when you were a child and when you were a baby and then when you were in utero, where you got your start is where everyone got their start. You were one cell big at some point in the past. You were a fertilized egg that had one set of these chromosomes from your mother and one set of chromosomes from your father, and that was enough information to make you a bipedal, a bipedal organism and to have a big brain and have all of the other things that are unique to humans, they're all encoded here somewhere. So that is really the challenge that we have to find where, where in this genome is the information that encodes how we are going to be biologically, that we're going to have all of these characteristics, we're going to have this capacity for language, we're going to do all the great things that we do, and chimpanzees don't. So we can rephrase this question a little bit and ask what makes humans unique genetically, and because we have the complete genome sequence of chimpanzee and human, we can answer this question with great precision. We can find all of the places in our genome where we are different from chimpanzee, the playing field, the genome, is three billion base pairs long. You get three billion base pairs from mom and three billion from dad. Chimpanzees is about the same, about three billion. And about 35 million of those are different between chimpanzees and humans. So that's a lot, 35 million differences, but it's way, way less than the three billion places. It's about one in a hundred places are different, which means 99 are the same and one is different. But there are so many of them, it adds up to over 30 million. So, um, and then there are a few other things but besides uh, individual base differences. There are um, some places where the chromosomes have um, swapped around, uh, uh, big places where they've inverted. And one chromosome fusion event that separates us from chimpanzees, our chromosome number two, um, existed as two separate chromosomes in the past because we see in all of the other great apes it's two separate chromosomes and we can even see if we look very closely at our chromosome 2 there's some special sequence that exists only at the ends of chromosomes normally it's in the middle of chromosome 2 right where this fusion would have taken place so it's um, a very ironclad evidence that what happened in the past was at some time this these two chromosomes fused together and were eventually inherited in all humans so that we now have this one chromosome too. Okay, so that is um, satisfying in a way in that we can get such a precise answer, but unsatisfying in another way in that what we would really like to have is this map between all the genetic differences between humans and chimpanzees and all of the biological differences. Where amongst those 35 million are the positions that actually matter. We know, because of a lot of theory and a lot of empirical data looking at molecular evolution, how DNA sequence changes over time, most of these changes don't matter at all. They just happen. They always happen. From one generation to the next, we're constantly having mutations that are passed on to the next generation, and most of these don't matter at all. They have no fitness consequence, positive or negative, for the offspring. So most of this 35 million differences between human and chimps are of no consequence. Where are the ones that are of consequence? Where are the ones that make us bipedal? Where are the ones that give us this big brain and do all the other things that um, we're interested in? Okay, so that's a hard problem. There are lots of, of biological differences, lots of physiological differences, and lots of genetic differences. How can we make this a smaller problem, reduce the size of this problem? Well, it would be naturally reduced if we had something related to us more closely than a chimpanzee. If only there was something more closely related than a chimpanzee. Well, it turns out such things have existed in the past. They're just gone now. Um, what is shown here is one um, uh, interpretation of the hominin fossil record of how the um, extinct species of the past that may or may not have led to us 
are related to one another. This is a, a very contentious field, the field of physical paleoanthropology. Um, someone told me once that there are more physical paleoanthropologists than there are bones to look at. So um, that's a recipe for contention if there ever was one. Um, and, and there are some open questions in this. Um, uh, who is directly ancestral to who, but one of the things that is very clear um, consensus amongst physical anthropologists is that Neanderthals are our closest extinct relatives. So these Neanderthal guys, they um, have this very, very characteristic morphology, this brow ridge here, an occipital bun here, a head that's lower and slung back more, um, bigger jaw, and they are different from modern human morphology, um, as exemplified here by uh, Cro-Magnon, Cro-Magnon, um, who lived almost at the same time as the um, Neanderthals. So this Cro-Magnon is anatomically modern human. This could be me or you, but it just happens to be the me or you that lived a long time ago. This could be your great, great times 2000 grandfather. Um, and you can see looking at these, you don't have to be a, a, an expert to um, spot the differences here. A real expert could point out a, a whole bunch of differences in tooth morphology, and th there's a lot that is characteristic, diagnostically characteristic about Neanderthal cranial morphology and um, uh, subcranial morphology. If they weren't different morphologically, then we never would have been interested in them in the first place. You can go and look outside and find the bones of many things that look like us. If they weren't distinct enough, we never would have looked carefully at them and wondered, what is this? And why don't we ever see any people today that look like this? They were distinct enough to be uh, demanding an explanation. So um, just to put them in a little bit of context, this is the Neanderthal and human. This is our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. So one can get lost in this sea of very fine differences, but when you um, look a little uh, more broadly for context here, the chimpanzee, you see that they're actually a lot more similar to us than they are different. They don't have this super massive jaw of the chimpanzee with this huge attachment point for powerful muscles, for um, uh, uh, having a powerful jaw and this huge canine teeth and this massive brow ridge and this tiny, tiny brain case compared to Neanderthals and humans. Neanderthals brains were about the size of ours, a little bit bigger on average, but there is a huge variance in humans today and there was a huge variance in Neanderthals and the range entirely overlaps. But on average their brains were a little bit bigger and both much, much bigger than what we see in our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. Um, temporarily, Neanderthals show up in the fossil record about 200,000 years ago is the time when you start finding things that everyone would agree that's clearly a Neanderthal. Um, and they go extinct inexplicably about 30,000 years ago. They disappear from the fossil record. Humans, modern humans, our um, phenotype shows up uh, about 130,000 years ago and of course is around today and has been around this entire time. So one of the things that we can say is that for most of the time that we've been around and most of the time that they were around, we were around together. We shared the planet. It's only a fairly recent development that we are the only hominin group that is on the planet. Um, about 30,000 years ago, there were many, many other things around, including the Neanderthals and including um, this very, very short uh, Homo floresiensis that you may have heard of that was found uh, about 10 years ago in Indonesia um, that people argue like crazy about what it was, um, perhaps a late surviving, even more archaic form, um, and some other things that uh, were, were clearly around until not that long ago. But now, they're all gone. Geographically, Neanderthals are known mostly from Europe. Uh, in this picture um, is site or sites where we have extracted DNA from fossil bones and shown by DNA sequence analysis that they're Neanderthals. And uh, not that long ago, this sample from Klodnikov was shown to be Neanderthal type. So their, um, their range existed well into Asia, and it's a really um, big open question exactly how far east did the Neanderthals go? Were they in China, for example? 
That is an open question. But they're known mainly from Europe, where we find lots of bones of, that are clearly Neanderthal, and also a lot of the stone tools that they made that are characteristic of the Neanderthal technology. So the field of ancient DNA, as I said, got started uh, in the 80s when DNA was extracted and sequenced for the first time from something extinct, the quagga. Um, that was uh, up the road at uh, my alma mater at Berkeley. And um, following um, uh, the invention of PCR, ancient DNA was one of the first applications of PCR that was used to get DNA from a few other extinct things, but it was largely a, a slow-moving field that you had to have a very, very well-preserved sample and handle it very carefully and get lucky uh, designing PCR primers that could amplify something. Um, and over the years, some other things trickled in where we could get a little bit of DNA from something and compare it to uh, whatever else we had DNA from and, and kind of say how things were related to other things. The quagga DNA, for example, showed clearly that this is very closely related to a horse, and no one was uh, surprised by that. Um, the field of ancient DNA, like many fields in uh, biosciences, has been revolutionized over the last five years or so by high throughput sequencing, some technologies that have become available for sequencing DNA much faster and much cheaper than we ever could before. The rate of growth in throughput in DNA sequencing is growing faster today than Moore's Law. It's growing faster than um, uh, the integrated circuits and computers are increasing in speed, and this uh, increase in technology is really being felt in all areas of biosciences, including ancient DNA. Um, it is the case that uh, 2001, we had the first human genome sequence at an amazing cost, billions of dollars, an enormous effort that was spread over many different research groups, many different really big labs who had warehouses full of the machines that were state-of-the-art at the time that would do DNA sequencing. Just uh, dozens and dozens of these machines in several places around the world churning out DNA sequence as fast as they could and got a draft of the human genome. Now, today, um, uh, you can generate a human genome sequence in about a day time, a day's time for a few thousand dollars. You could have your genome sequenced if you would like to do that for a few thousand dollars. And this has led to uh, enormous advances in our understanding about the genetic variation that exists in the world. It's almost certainly the case that someone who is born today will have their genome sequenced as part of their um, uh, understanding the diseases and their susceptibility to things and as part of their uh, uh, medical care in their lifetime. It's just getting to be so fast and so cheap and so easy to do that. Um, the hard part now is making it useful, understanding the <laughs> DNA sequence. Um, but in any case, the um, first machine was from a company called 454, and we used that a lot in the early days and then migrated to this Illumina technology. This uh, Illumina company is down in San Diego. and. They currently make what we think are the um, best machines for sequencing DNA really fast and really cheaply.